Welcome to the Love of the Star podcast. I am Bobby Belt, Dallas Cowboys insider for 105 through the fan in Dallas. Joined as always by former NFL scout Brian Broaddus. He is now the former Super Bowl winning NFL scout Brian Broaddus. Sorry, Brian, I'm very distracted because I'm just now realizing behind me, uh, I still have a Merry Christmas sign up. This literally just dawned on me that I have a Merry Christmas sign up in my house. This is how aware I am of my own home. Uh, Brian is a former uh, Super Bowl Super Bowl winning NFL scout. He's now the co-host of the G-Bag Nation, 2 to 7 p.m., Monday through Friday on 105 Through the Fan, and the pre- and post-game co-host on the Dallas Cowboys Radio Network, where after every Cowboys win or loss, you can call in and Brian oh. exactly what he thinks about you <laughs> if you just call in and let him have it. Uh, Brian, <laughs> how are you doing? It's on to San Francisco, a road victory. The last time the Cowboys had a road victory, you were still in your like on your first job in the NFL. I was at the game. I was oh, at that game. I was at oh, the yeah, game. you mentioned that. Yeah, I, you I was, cheered. You said, I, run to Alvin I, Harper. I, I, I said, run to Alvin Harper. Yeah. And, uh, well, Bob, I was going to open this show with a, a fire the cannons. Fire the cannons. <laughs> fire the cannons. We, uh, oh, gosh. Yeah. So we we had fun with, uh, with Gene yesterday. But, yeah, it's uh, – a great win uh, for the Cowboys. Uh, I'll tell you what, on tape, looked outstanding. A lot of areas. I, I know everybody has got the concerns with the uh, with what's going on with Brett Maher and stuff like that. But if you just break the game down for what it was, I'll tell you what, coaches did a hell of a job with the game plan. Players did a hell of a job. Really night and day from what we saw uh, what happened in Washington, you know, a couple of weeks ago, players were locked in quarterback was locked in offensive line, having to shuffle around receivers with separation D defenders doing a great job of not letting them run the football, you know, playing. Uh, no, you were worried about Tampa making contested game for you. You made it a contested game for them and you affected uh, one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play. Uh, this game in that ball game, and and it was uh, it was one of the reasons why you got a great victory there. Yeah, let's talk. Let's lead off to well, let's talk about the quarterback because I mean that that's obviously the the big headline. I would which quarterback? Their quarterback or your quarterback? Your quarterback is the okay. big. Headline. Uh, you, it's so it's funny. You know, after you had what twelve three and outs on fifteen drives against Washington, you come into this game and you go three and out twice. And in fact, the first five times Dak dropped back. It was three incompletions. It was a sack. And then it was a ball that kind of sailed the gallop. And even though they picked up a first down, I don't know about you, Brian, but that, that's the first first down of the game coming on the third series. And I'm like, offense doesn't have it today. Here we go. Here we go again. This is a continuation of it. But but after that gallop catch, everybody kind of settled down. They got into rhythm. Dak, I think, completed something like 10 passes in a row after that. Uh, it was damn near perfect. Um, you know, just a, a, a great game. I, he's has he played better games before? Maybe, maybe a couple in a regular season. But given the stakes, given the history, everything else, this is this is to this point the defining win of his career by far. Through seven years, this is the defining win of his career. Yeah, I think you're. I, I think you've got that right. Um, I know he's played games in. Uh, you know, in 2016, we were talking about games where he's won at Lambeau Field as a rookie game. He won at Heinz Field as a rookie. You know, those to go into those places and get victories. Uh, but yesterday, it was it was total command of the situation. Uh, initially, it didn't look good, as you mentioned. But then all of a sudden, it's kind of like, the roughing the passer penalty, the some things kind of started to click. You talked about the ball uh, to Gallup and and what they were able to do there. I I mean he made some he made some just tremendous throws in that game. And you got to give uh, you know going into this game, you really weren't sure. You really weren't sure. Um, you know, how Dallas would be able to, it, to me, it was going to be about, could you block this front? Could mm -hmm. you find, could you find a way? And, you know, to get the sack with Vita Vea and you're kind of like wondering, oh, damn, uh, is this going to be an all day thing? But they, they really, they did a great job of, of holding up uh, on their end. 
the offensive line. I know that Tampa going in, you're worried about that middle area. The outside, where was the pass rush? You know, and that's the great thing. I thought you had a really nice game uh, from Tyron Smith. You had a really nice game from Tyler Smith playing on the other side. And they were able to match up. And you know, once that once that Peters went out of the game right before half, uh, by the way, that's a hip flexor injury. Uh, you and I talked about it today on uh, yeah. on our show, the G Bag Nation. Uh, so he's the one that you're probably not going to have for this upcoming game. Uh, but when he went out, Tyler Smith probably caught it like a breath of fresh air. Like, oh wow, I don't have to block Vita Vey anymore. You know, I don't have to. <laughs> I don't have to deal with these big old tackles. You know, they kick him to the outside. But they did a great, a great job, those inside three. Martin, uh, Biotish, McGovern, you know, that pass rush, that after that first initial win, when Biotish got swam, uh, swum on that play, they were they were on it. And, and even when there was a little bit of that pressure, you could see Dak was, you know, a third and I think there was a third six that he had a 10-yard run on. So, yeah, it, everybody was really, really locked in to their responsibilities, their assignments, and how much of a physical game they were going to have to play to win this thing. Yeah, I guess uh, maybe the, the easiest way to take this one is just let's kind of do a review of – because it was dominant before. It was not as close as 31-14. to 14. They, they honestly beat the brakes off of Tampa yeah. uh, in this one. And, and on both sides of the ball, I think you had – uh, a number of stars. So uh, since we've already started with Dak, let's let's spend this first segment talking about the offense a little bit. You mentioning the fact that Tyler Smith had to bounce outside to left tackle. Yeah. How about you? Whenever I see that happen, whenever I see, oh, somebody's shifting or somebody's coming, I just naturally, like the next three snaps, like that's all I'm looking at is what's happening here. And then that, everything else is kind of secondary. And my eyes immediately gravitated towards Tyler Smith. And I was like, all right, let's see how this is. At each rep, it was like, oh, okay, all right. He's comfortable. He's playing well. I don't think you can undersell that now. Is he a perfect player? No, Tyler Smith's not a perfect player. He sells a lot of problems with penalties and stuff like that. But just the admirable job he's done handling whatever, giving you at, at the very least average to above average play at whatever you're asking him to do at any given moment. I, I don't think that can be undersold from a guy who is barely 21 years old and is a rookie who had just come out of Tulsa. Yeah, that's uh, I, I I there's a lot of things that have gone right this season, and Tyler Smith is one of those things that's gone right, and uh, uh, a, a major thing that's gone right. There were so many questions. You look at where he was in Week One. Mm -hmm. to where he was yesterday against that that team that he faced in week 1. And it is a it's really to me a night and day player. He is he's found ways to get better throughout. It's there's some two or three plays where you cover your eyes, but overall for him to to go from tackle, well really from guard to tackle, back to guard, back to tackle and be a rookie. No. Come on, no. I mean, that's that is uh, that's some high level stuff coming from him. And what's really interesting about this Cowboys offensive line, they always talk about how much they like continuity, and everybody yep. talks about playing with the same five guys. They really haven't played with the same five guys all year, and mm -hmm. maybe because of the fact that they've had to do shuffling around throughout, has has given them an opportunity to when they have to make those moves, that seems that things seem to work out. I, I'm going to be honest with you, Bobby. When you and I talked in pregame and you alerted me like, hey, I'm thinking that Jason Peters is going to start at left tackle. Mm -hmm. I wasn't too sure about that. I wasn't too <laughs> sure. And I and I I think what's happened with Jason Peters, the hip flexor, you know, he was hurt on a just a normal block. He's trying to extend a block. He's a 40-year-old guy. And maybe, yep. they've, maybe they've used up all the snaps with him. Maybe that's, you know, all the snaps this year that he's had to take, you know, maybe that's where we're at right now. But I, I was just so impressed with how as an offensive line that they were able to play in that football game. Did you notice, uh, and I, I don't, 
I don't know if I noticed it as much as the game progressed. I don't know if it's because I wasn't noticing as much because they were, you know, in hurry up and they were having uh, success doing things like that, or if it's just they didn't do as much of it. But did you notice early on in that game how much late switching from the sideline they were doing on both sides of the ball? How much, you know, oh, we're lining everybody up here, and then at the last second, oh, yeah. everybody's moving over here and doing this. Yeah. And, like, I mean, even down to special teams, I think it was the first punt of the game, they had the gunners – then switch and like and it was just this everything they were doing on offense defense and special teams early was let's do late switches let's uh, you know get them thinking they were definitely and I know we talked about it in the pregame show that that was kind of our expectation was that everybody Fossil Kellen Moore Dan Quinn they were going to dip into their bag of tricks as best they could what did you think about specifically the game Kellen Moore called I'll tell you what uh, you know Kellen Moore takes a lot of grief. Uh, from Cowboy Nation, takes a lot of grief from people that cover the team nationally. Um, you know, this is this is just goes to show you um, what this offense is capable of when it doesn't turn the ball over. You know, when they and, and Kellen Moore. I mean, Mike McCarthy was in a really bad spot yesterday, and it's fourth and three. And yeah, he could send a field goal team on. Or he could go out there and know exactly like I'm playing Tom Brady today. I got a shaky or a balk, uh, a shaky field goal. I was using bulky is the word. I don't know if that's the right word, but <laughs> look at a, sh a shaky kicker. Do I take a chance on missing a field goal here, or do I go for it on fourth and three and try and kind of figure this thing out, you know, and get points? And you know, and you know, he he went to Kellen Moore and he's like, let's go. And Kellen Moore had a great play ready. It's like it's almost like Kellen Moore anticipated, and maybe Mike McCarthy earlier in the earlier in the sequence told him, "Kellen, you got you got you're go, we're going on fourth down here. You can have plays ready. Be ready to go." And but Kellen had a great play call, the, the you know the double pick, and then run C.D. Lamb behind all that. You know that's that's just that's just winning football right there. And you know, but there was. There were some times where Kellen Moore, it's like, listen, I'm not going to bang my head uh, just trying to run the ball inside. And, and you know, they ran it a few times inside. But where was the majority of the running game? Dak scrambling, toss sweeps. Perimeter, and, yeah. Perimeter run game. You know, it's like, yeah. let's not let's not kill ourselves trying to run for one and two yards. And I kind of felt like if they could have got the perimeter game going, that they would have been able to – that all of a sudden the Tampa defense has to stretch, and then you hit it up inside with Zeke and, you know, as they're playing. But it also turned into, you know, Kellen Moore, once the second half started and they had the lead, he kept throwing the football. You know, it wasn't yeah. like – I mean, it's kind of like, listen, if you're not going to rush the passer and when you blitz, I'm going to hit you, you know, on that 26-yard pass to C.D. Lamb – what a great blitz pickup by by Pollard. Pollard yeah. comes Pollard goes left to left to right across the the pocket and picks up White on the blitz. You now you, now you're running teams out of blitzing right there. When you pick up blitzes and make big plays, but Kellen Moore, I, I think he he kept his foot on the pedal in this one, and um, I, I I tip of the cap to to way that uh, he managed that football game. Michael Gallup and Dalton Schultz, I think, came up really big. Uh, Gallup, I mean, didn't have some absurd game, but he he made plays, and it's the it's, it's something that just we haven't seen from him. Schultz was huge. Schultz, that was that was one of the best games he's played. You see why Dak and him just Dak trusts him so much. They they've just got that connection, um, and that they're able to work it. But I I, I thought. They, it, it was incredible that they were able to dominate like they did without needing C.D. Lamb yesterday because Michael Gallup and Dalton Schultz played big roles. No, you're absolutely right, and great job by Dalton Schultz. I, I don't know what you were thinking in the because I don't know you were probably standing up and wandering around like you do in the press box, but <laughs> you were when 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 he threw that touchdown pass to Dalton Schultz and Dalton Schultz ran a route that uncovered himself like he felt Dak going to the sidelines. Instead of going to the sidelines with him, he, he peeled back. He peeled back between and found a, a window. And Dak, yeah, soft spot. Dak, Dak fired a beautiful ball. And I know that Zach Wolchuk and I were in the studio, and Dak's rolled to his right, and we're both rolling. 
run, 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 throw it out of bounds. So, oh no. Yeah. And we're like, you know, we're, we're just yeah. surprised that he just, but Dak rolling to his left, throwing the ball the way he did back into the inside there to Dalton Schultz. That's just a big time throw, big time catch. But I was happy to see him. And we talked about this uh, in, in, maybe in the last podcast, man, I'm on so many, you and I are on so many platforms now. <laughs> I can't remember, but I, it might've been either Cowboys or with the pregame, but we kind of talked about Michael Gallup needing to have a big game or a yeah. game where once again, you'd see that smile on his face, you know, and he made he made several really good that that play that he made that he just that ball that he on the sidelines it seemed like it hung in the air forever and he went up to go get it comes down feet and bounce he's running along the inline you know you're thinking man they can't overturn this that he's he's in bound you know I mean it's just the way that his his understanding of how to stay in bounds how to run routes, how to contort his body. You know, they they needed plays from him yesterday, and they got him. I mean, yeah. and, and, and to go back to Dalton Shorts, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of rambling on No, here. you're good, you're good. But go back to Dalton Shorts. You now wonder if the 49ers look at this game this week, and we'll get into it towards the end of the week, uh, but you wonder if the 49ers are thinking, we got to take away Dalton Schultz. We, we, it's not about... CD Lamb, it's about taking away Dalton Schultz. Much like teams tried to do when you're playing against Tony Romo and Jason Witten. You know, yeah, yeah we'll we'll deal with Des Bryant, but you know, we got to take Witten out of this game. And you wonder if the 49ers plans, D'Amico Ryan's, if you wonder if he's getting ready. And by the way, I hope I hope he just spends all his time worried about these interviews he's about to do. And really they're probably work. hoping Dan Quinn's doing yeah, the same. Yeah, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. But yeah, the, you know, D'Amico Ryan's. You wonder if the San Francisco defensive uh, coaches are thinking we got to take Dalton Schultz out of this game. That that's the one consistent thing that Dak Prescott has. Now there's uh, I, I'm gonna we'll do defense next segment. We're doing offense this segment. I'm I'm gonna have one criticism for each, just because you always got to have something to build on or or something to point out is, hey, this isn't working. So, Brian, here's my thing today. I know we've said Pollard has basically surpassed Zeke as this or that, or or Pollard does this or that better. I, I've I've come to a a position that is is not fun to say anymore, Brian. But this is where I'm at now, especially after watching the game yesterday. I have reached a point where I believe Ezekiel Elliott just is not a productive football player. Am I wrong? I, I would say, and I'm not doing this because of his toughness and all that. Sure. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, there's a, because there's a time. Okay. I'm trying to say how I'm going to say this because I do think you're right about Tony Pollard. And I do think you're right about handing him the football. And I do think you're right about throwing him a slant uh, behind another route for a first down, but there, I do think there's a place for Ezekiel Elliott. Now, I would have liked to have seen him get in on that third and one on the goal line, you mm -hmm. know, and they got stopped and then they had to run the boot with Dak for the touchdown. But I'd like to have seen, but I, I, it didn't happen. I, I think for this year, I think for what, you know, for how many games ever remaining or left, um, there's something for both these guys to be a part of. Does, does Pollard need more opportunity, more touches than Zeke? Yeah, he does. But I think there's certain things that they 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 with Zeke. I, I think he understands where his what his role is now. I think he understands that he's not the fastest or the shiftiest or the best catcher or anything like that. I think he understands what his role is, and I'm okay with that right now. Because there, there's going to be a time where they're going to like move on, you know. They might not be able to get Pollard done, you know. It might yeah. turn into a franchise tag, but we'll see. I I I just feel like that you're on to something. I, I think the eye test tells you that Pollard is a more productive player uh, than Zeke, and but I still think there's a, there's a, a a time and a place to have him uh, in the lineup, and I'm talking about Zeke. Uh, well, to give Tony an opportunity to catch his breath. You're listening to the Love of the Star podcast. The Love of the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. 
All right, Brian, uh, let's take a look at the defensive side of the ball now. Uh, there's, again, a lot of areas, a lot, a lot of people you can single out here and go to. Well, let, me ask, let me ask you this real quick. Yeah. I, I, you know, you you have a, an argument. Go ahead and tell your argument on that. Go ahead. I mean. On, on which part? The Zeke part? Yeah, the Zeke part. Go ahead. And, I, yeah. just, I, I just think that what you're seeing now is that he's not even as effective as he once was in short yardage situations. Too often, I just I don't think he runs with the same power that he once did. I, I think they they ran him into the ground and the tread came off the tires a lot faster than you'd expect. And just to me, I, I just don't think he's productive enough on a per snap basis. I'm not saying he can't give you good reps every now and then, but on a per snap basis, I just think he's a net negative. I feel like anytime you're giving Zeke the ball, you're 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 you've got maybe four or five other things you can do on that play that would be more productive. And so I just I I feel like he's just not a productive football player in in the macro anymore. I just, I guess my argument to that is together, I think it, I don't think that maybe Pollard's helping Zeke. I kind of feel like that Zeke is helping Pollard at least get rest, you know? Oh, so. oh and they'll, they'll tell you, people who have been around the team, they'll tell you for even the ones who wanted to see more of Pollard, they'll tell you there is something to the physicality that Zeke runs with and how yeah. that gives juice to the other guys. Like that gives yeah. light. So like, I understand that dynamic for sure. Uh, it's just... You know, yesterday he was about the only guy on offense who wasn't productive. Everybody else was doing doing productive things, and and <laughs> I felt like the the most productive thing Zeke did was he sold a fake really well that Dak bootlegged and scored. Yeah. And it's just when he, when the ball's in his hands, I don't know that that's ever going to be your best use of giving the ball to somebody, um, even in short yardage situations. At this point, he's just he's not hitting them like he once was. But that's that's just kind of where it is for me now. Uh, on the defensive side of the ball. There, there's a number of guys we can talk about. I'll, I'll let you pick. Which, which player would you like to talk about first? Because there's a lot of well, them I, that were I, heroes I, yesterday. You know, it's funny. I just had this thought in my head that the, there's a Dallas a group from Dallas. You might know this. Uh, uh, Deep Blue something, I think, is it? it it's oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Deep, Deep Blue, they were Breakfast at Tiffany's. Breakfast at Tiffany's. And that's, well, you know, it's like the song goes along, and then one of the lines is, well, that's the one thing we got. You know, yeah. and maybe maybe that was Zeke when you're talking about the fake. <laughs> when you're talking yeah, about sure. the fake, well, it's like, well, that's the one thing we got. It helped know, from <laughs> yeah. that song. So yeah, uh, you want to talk a defense? I'll talk. Uh, I want to hear you. I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts on Cowboys safeties or Leighton Vanderesh. Uh, which is more impactful? I just give me just which one? Jay, Cowboys, here's, here's what here's, here's what I want to say. Here's Kirsten what I want to say. And Wilson, Kirsten Wilson, and I want to either Kirsten Wilson or I want to hear thoughts on Leighton Vanderesh. I, I thought I thought the two guys that set the tone early that really took Tampa out of their game were Micah Parsons and Donovan Wilson. I thought Donovan Wilson was great in this game, specifically early in the game, setting the tone, not just you know, in terms of making plays, but playing with physicality, punishing people, making them regret coming into his area. Uh, I, I thought the tone that he set was huge. And J. Ron Curse, I mean, was fantastic, you know, breaking up passes, doing what he does. I, I've said this. I think a lot of people view, and, and rightfully so, I think he is one. A lot of people view, oh, Mike is the leader. Mike is the leader, blah, blah, blah. I think it's a misunderstanding to, to just say Mike is the leader of the defense. I think a lot of people on that defense answered to J. Ron Curse. I think you're absolutely right about J, that. J. Ron Curse to me is the it, he is the heart and soul. He is he is the emotion of that defense. Micah plays with a lot of passion, things like that. But in terms of just the raw emotion and 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 who everybody turns to when things are a little unstable, it's J. Ron Curse. That is that's their guy that they look to when things are going wrong. So to me, just the way J. Ron Curse played in terms of playing through pain like he has all year. He's been hurt all year. All year. Played through pain, the way he leveled up and played maybe his best game of the year, mm -hmm. uh, I think. And, and not just, you know, playing his normal safety role and coming up in the box. He was taking Russell Gage on some stuff. Like, like they haven't put him on a receiver like Russell Gage all year. They didn't do it to him last year either. He was being asked to do things that he doesn't normally do, had a ton of pass breakups, and that is – that's their that's their emotional core on defense is J. Ron Curse. And so I thought Curse and Wilson were absolutely incredible. If I were to, and you're in that locker room every day. So if I were to ask you this question, you take a secret poll 
mm-hmm. of, the, of the defensive players. And would you say the secret poll is J. Ron Curse is the leader or Micah Parsons the leader? That people that they they would follow. Curse by probably a three to one margin, if not more. You know what? I absolutely believe you because talking to people in that locker room too, I, I don't get to get in it every day like you do, but I know enough people over there that would tell me they're like, you you hit the nail on the head about curse. I there's a utmost, there's a lot of respect for Micah Parsons. Folks, sure. please, folks, don't get bent. Don't, yeah, this, don't, this, this is not a backhand this, of Micah this, Parsons. This, this at is all. not not at all. Don't get bent, folks. You know, don't look at Micah Parsons, love the star, <laughs> hate you, and all that. We don't, but we're just making a point. And I think you made an excellent point about uh about the safeties and about the leadership from from Curse. I love the way that Wilson played the game yesterday. I love the way that Leighton Vander Esch played the game yesterday. It was great. I think that tells you a lot about the way that Dan Quinn and this defensive staff addressed how they were going to play the game. They they weren't interested in having uh, Gallimore and Bohanna active. They went with a quicker front, and they also went with, with Hankins up front, knowing that, listen, we might not get into a game where they're going to run the football. You know, they 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 really they got after Tom Brady. They they to be honest with you, I don't think these defensive coaches respected Tampa's running game. I think no. it tur- I think it turned into, and and usually when it turns into a running game, they they felt like okay, if Tampa's going to try and run the ball, we're going to handle it with Hankins, Van Der Esch, and Wilson. That's how we're going to handle the running game. And it turned into, but Tampa ran the ball, what, 12 times, something like that, some ridiculous number. It yeah, it was 12. It was, some, it was some ridiculous number, like we said. Leighton Van Der Esch playing pass coverage yesterday. I mean, how many times did you see Leighton Van Der Esch having to drop and play in the middle of the field? Oh, I, oh, he was he was great in coverage. He was great in run support. He he rushed the passer a couple times yeah. and was good. He, he was excellent. He and Micah Parsons, I thought, both had really great complete yeah. games doing everything well we talked about what a what a problem for the buccaneers donovan smith was going to be we we we, we picked that one out early and i think their offensive line as much as the cowboys had been shuffling around you know putting ryan jensen in there at center that was that wasn't as clean of an operation as we've seen uh you know with with a tom brady led team for for sure yeah no it's it's funny i i was Having this conversation uh, with Patrick Walker at uh, DallasCowboys.com as we were riding the bus over there to the stadium, and we were talking about how Jensen was going to play, and I was making the same sort of point of, you know, from a, a Dallas perspective, fans probably see that and go, "Oh my gosh, Jensen, he's so good." Here he comes, steps in this, and I was like, fans need to think about it from the flip side. Think about the growing pains or the difficulties of Tyron Smith trying to find. No his- question, no question. The Buccaneers were going to be facing the same thing, and they're facing it from a center exchange and a guy who's supposed to be calling out protections and helping out with all that sort of stuff. And so it's, it, it, there was even more going on that. So I almost felt better knowing Jensen was just going to be dropped in there um, because there was no telling what kind of rhythm he was going to be into. And, and the defense, made it, but the, the guys on the interior, the young guys on the interior, Oh, Diggy Zua and Golston have been great lately. They, they have been so good. They were great against the commanders with a bunch yeah, of guys. They, they were two of the only ones. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. What did you think about the game from Israel McQuamu? He, uh, McQu- I, I remember we were standing out at practice, uh, and I know one of your your favorite scouting tells on corners is when you see them take a receiver and they run the drag route across. They carry it. They carry it. Yeah. And I remember we were out in Oxnard, and they were putting McQuamu on the slot on Lamb. Couldn't and believe it. Carried- he carried Lamb the whole way over and knocked the ball away. And he did it twice in that practice. And I remember that was the first time where I was like, could he – he might be able to still – he played corner at South Carolina some, but I was like, he might actually be able to do that here. It looks like – and but I kind of – six weeks ago, I know I asked Brad Sham when everything was going. I was like, do you think they'd consider McQuamu at quarterback or, or corner? And he was like, maybe, yeah, this is some – and – Just six weeks, very surprised. But look, they drafted him to be a safety. But I'll always remember when he got on that call with Jerry Jones, the secret draft audio, 
he told Jerry, Jerry, you're getting the best cornerback in the draft, even though they planned on him being a safety. And then he's like, well, whatever, I'll play whatever. But man, he is, he is long. He's physical. He is not afraid. That guy, that guy does not play scared football at all. And, and, and I love what he did for them in the, however many snaps he played. I think he played 37. Um, but just it's it worked out great. I'll be interested to see. And, and Brian, I'm curious if you think this. Do you think this was a Tampa specific plan, or do you think the plan from now on? See, I was going to say, Bobby, you, if you've been to Cat's Deli in New York, the the famous deli. When I, when I go to New York, I go to McDonald's, Brian. Come okay, on. Cat's <laughs> Deli in New York, you take a number, right? They call yep. out your number. Why the hell are these coaches like played cat's deli with the left cornerback spot? You know, it's like Israel, take a number. And I think a lot of it has to do. They it's so funny because I was asked a question from Gavin Dawson today, and he's right. He goes, Why is it taking him so long to realize this kid could probably play corner for you? You know, there are a couple of pass plays, and you're thinking, here's this, you know, a guy that's super long, super tall. And he's not supposed to be able to play. He's not supposed to be able to play slot, but he can play slot. And Played so it really now, well. And so now you're asking, well, okay, why are they trying all these cats delis? No, take a number, take a number, take a number, take it. And Mukwamu, uh, number forty-eight. Okay, oh, I'm forty-eight. And then you go out there and you're like, oh, here's your corned beef sandwich. But like he's the like he looks the best, like him and Bland and. But as they go through all these guys, as they as they work through roads and they work through, you know, it's just right, Joseph. Right, Joseph. It's just they're working through all these guys. And, and let me be real honest to you, Bobby. I man, I did not. I was not digging the last two minutes of that game after the onside kick. Yeah, and they, and they launched that ball on roads. Yeah, that. That scared me, Bobby. I I don't. Yeah, you saw he can't. He's not. He can't run like you. We talked about it. We talked about that. And he could look at. He could look inside. Think he was going to get help, bro. You got to run that thing down. So, but I is he? I mean, have they found? Have they found the guy finally? Have have, has has cats has cats deli finally (laughs) found their guy? You know, we 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 we've talked about sandbagging theory before Dan Quinn told us all this week, I feel comfortable about what we're going to do there. I don't want to talk about it. And we all just kind of assumed, I think like, so okay, is he, is he was the plan all along? That's what he said. I know what we're doing and I feel comfortable with it. He's like, I don't want to talk about it though. And wow. so we just assumed it was taught. So he, but I wonder if when they lost to Jacksonville, regardless of what they say, I wonder if Dan Quinn said, we've got a problem at corner. Cause that was the game where Kelvin Joseph really got burned. Yeah. I wonder if he said, we're not winning this division, and I'm not tipping my hand about what we're doing in the playoffs, but I know what I'm doing now. McQuam was taking that spot. I It, it almost feels like he knew for a few weeks what he was going to do there. And it makes sense. So, because so he, he just he just, play, he just yeah, played he just had, all those. He, yeah. had a phony, he had a phony yeah. rotation he never intended on playing against Tampa because he went out there and was like, nope, we're, we're going. When It was Monday of last week. He said, I know what we're doing. That was before he saw the week of practice. He said, he said I know what we're doing. I feel really comfortable about it. Wow. And said, but I don't want to talk about it. So to me, I think that it, it makes sense too, because like I mentioned at the beginning of this, we saw him in Oxnard play corner and he played it well. And it was it was kind of but they had enough corners. Yeah, but but Bobby, they the poor kid played safety. If you went up and talked to him in the locker room, like I'm sure you did, he, he'll tell you I'm a corner. But they play him at safety. They play him at corner. They play him at safety. You know, it was like it's kind of like they they were trying to kind of figure out what he was. But you're telling me that Dan Quinn he sandbagged this thing for a couple of weeks to get to get. I think the, that's I think that's what he did. To wow. be, honestly, when they lost to Jacksonville, we all wrote off the division, and that was the moment when they lost to Jacksonville where they said Kelvin Joseph isn't working. Who's going to be the corner? And I think at that point he just said, I'm going to throw out phony solutions, but I know what we're doing. Well, so like Mullen and all those guys are just – that's. I that's mean, just, Mullen's depth, you need a body. You still yeah. need him. Um, but in terms of actually rolling him out, there's a real option. Because McQuamble wasn't a part of the equation at all. And then before he even sees this week of practice, he said, I know what we're doing. And he knew it was going to be McQuamble. That to me says he had made up his mind weeks ago, knew it was probably going to be Tampa. It was like, I feel comfortable with McQuamble's size playing against them. 
So that's Man. just my, that's my conspiracy. Now here's my one criticism. Bessie Noel for sure. <laughs> here's my one criticism of the game from yesterday uh, for, from the defense. I gave you an offensive one. Uh, I don't, I don't think he was awful, a black hole or anything in coverage, but Trayvon Diggs in coverage I did not think was very good, and I thought that in tackling he olayed about a half a dozen times. It, it was it was not – he wasn't finishing tackles, and there were several times he just went, ah, I think I'll just kind of step aside from this collision here. Of, of you better be careful. You better be careful. I, I drew Cowboy Nation. Cowboy Nation has gone after me on Twitter today about that whole thing. Like, I love I lo- I lo- Diggs. Seven, I- third and seven, man, you get a chance to get off the field. Just tackle in front of the sticks. You know, slow the guy down. Others will get to you. Man, your, your, your brothers out there are playing their rear off. And what happens? You give a third and seven up. It's up being an 11-yard play to a running back. And now you're gonna, now you're you have to make a, a curse has to make a play. You you make that tackle, it's it's you're off the field. I, I thought. I thought. I thought he played the worst game in the secondary yesterday. I thought Diggs was the worst. You're gonna game. get in trouble. You're gonna get. In trouble. But I, and I love Diggs, and I think Diggs played. I think Diggs played at a really high level most of this year. That was not his. That was not his standard. And I think he'd tell you that. I think Diggs would tell you he didn't you play think, the standard. Do you think that? Do you think Kyle Shanahan goes after him in this game? I, I think Kyle Shanahan, knowing him and the way he designs things, like. Kyle Shanahan may be the able jet to get sweep the jet sweep. Yeah. Running yeah I mean, I mean, Kyle Shanahan may be able to get Debo Samuel one-on-one against Chauncey Golston, the way he's able to dry off things up. So I, I don't know how he's, I don't know who he'll target, but he'll look for a mismatch and he'll get it. Uh, but it, it'll I, be, we'll have a lot to talk about with that game too. I'll say this, Bobby. I don't degree. I don't disagree with your statement. You just made about dicks. I don't disagree. That's good. But, but the but, you, but you pro, ran a lot today. <laughs> the pro football focus and all that will tell you, you know, pro football focus will tell you all the opportunities that he had in that game and that the coverage numbers and stuff were fine and all that. I I I you know what? I think he can cover it. He absolutely can cover. I he just hasn't done it well the last two weeks, really. It's been a struggle. Yeah, and and hopefully he gets that corrected. You are listening to the Love of the Star podcast. The Love of the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, it is now time for our favorite part of the show. It is the Dean Julia Love of the Star mailbag where I'm very upset because Dean Julia was at the game and we were supposed to meet up and he was late coming in with traffic and so he didn't get there till kickoff and I I didn't have a chance to go. So we did not get a chance to meet up. I'm very sorry about that, uh, but Dean, Julie, when you come, I blame in, that on you. I don't blame that on him. It's honestly, it probably. I think everything can be traced back to me, to be honest. Uh, but because of that, Brian, I'm going to include a Dean Julia question in the. Let's Dean go with it. Go with it. Yeah. Back. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, first question here from Dean Julia: Do you think Schultz to Ferguson plus Hendershot will be a smooth transition next year? Ferguson makes big plays. But we know how much trust Dak has in Schultz. I think Dak has a lot of trust in every single one of those tight ends in that room. Uh, I, I think where the transition might you you want it to be a little better is I think the tight ends were blocking a lot better in the first three quarters of the season than they had the last four or five games. I'm going to ask you a question from the Dean Julia mailbag. <laughs> Hit me. If you could franchise one, you get to franchise Schultz again, or you get to franchise Pollard. Um, and I have to lose the other, or I can work out an extension. You only you only get to keep one. Um, I know that people think it sounds good. Schultz. It's terrible radio, by the way. I tag I tag Schultz. That's what I do. You don't you don't you you don't like that? You froze. We froze. That's okay. It happens. Brian, so uh, based off of what you said, uh, I would uh, I would tag uh, Schultz. That's who I would tag. I would let Pollard. Win. Okay, I lost you there for a second. We so we did like, lose each other, but what it is is I would tag Schultz, and I know that makes me sound crazy to some people, um, but I would tag Schultz because I just I'm doing everything I can in the best interest of the quarterback and the the chemistry and the trust the quarterback has in that guy. I don't know that I can as easily find in the draft as I feel like I can find a Malik Davis 
or a Rico Dowdle or a Tony Pollard or whatever. I trust the scouting staff to go find me a running back who can be productive. I I tell you what, man, I don't disagree with you. Boom! Believe, look at, we're agreeing on everything today. I hate the fact that I'm agreeing with you, but <laughs> I, you know what, Dalton Schultz has become, and I know he got the holding call, and I, you know, that's just not his. Company. He's been a good blocker this year. He has, he has for the most part. Yeah, I will. I will say this though, he is so reliable catching the football. That ball he caught up the sidelines, basically. I mean, I, I think I'm leading to. I think I'm leaning to franchising Schultz and and you know and one of these running backs that I've looked at in the draft already can I can maybe get that's what go, I'm about. go trade up for Bijan. Let's make it happen, Brian. Uh, next question here from Johnny Footlong. Uh, what? <laughs> Quinn went back to moving Micah around last night. Worked well against this running attack in San Francisco. Might we see more of him at linebacker? You think you think we see a, a little bit more floating from Micah Parsons as, as opposed to just straight up edge rushing? Yeah, I think you're going to have to. Uh, well, I'm going to look forward to uh, on as we tape this on Tuesday night to watch the 49ers. I'm interested to see. You know, Trent Williams is just a bad man. I mean, a bad man. He's, and, he's still at the very top of his game. Yeah, God, he's just a, he's just so good. So I'm, I'm really curious. I'm really curious. I would do everything in my power to probably keep Micah from not rushing him. I, I, I would, I would, I would say, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice some Fowlers and guys like that along the way uh, to, to maybe keep Micah clean in this game and uh, see if I can, you know, McGlinchey, I need to see how he's playing. We'll see how this uh, 49er front is. Maybe there's a spot or two that you can, match up and but I, I would keep moving them around if I could uh next question this one's from a lot of people uh and we kind of discussed it there but I don't think we we directed it this specifically but several people asking now uh do the Cowboys just permanently say Israel Mukwamu you are our third corner this is Mukwamu Bland Diggs and then well I don't know if this is an if this should be an official position change well if the if 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 you believe if everybody believes in your conspiracy theory, yeah, I mean Dan do, Quinn's been. Do you, do you think that's the worst conspiracy theory in the world? No, I don't. I'm not. I don't. I don't <laughs> think it's so. like go ahead, go ahead and play guys off the street before you play your real guy. I think it's absolutely brilliant. To be honest with you, I like what you're saying. Yeah, if McQuamu would be my guy, I I don't think I'm playing. I don't think I'm playing Xavier Rhodes in any more of these playoff games. I'm just not. I'm scared about him and the deep ball and his running and all that. I'm just. I don't think it's a good thing right now. The this question here from James seventy nine X and and this is something we have not touched on for the most part just because there's so much else to talk about. They ended up winning. I don't know how much there's to discuss. But what is the plan to fix the kicker problem? Brian brought us. Uh, both is both. is there a kicker problem? You know what? It, it's it's to me, it's it was concerning. Yes, um, mm -hmm. is it something that you know? Was, we had Christy Scales on the sideline reporter for the Cowboys uh, on our show at the end of the day here on Tuesday, and Scoop Scoop said there that Bones Fossils said there wasn't an operational issue. So now that's on the kicker. Um, you know, there's. There was things, and you should go back and listen because she was breaking it down about like Brian Anger like putting down white a spot to put the ball down. Uh, the Craig Wolderstadt, they moved the spot. They they said no, you can't do that. I was gonna say that the league had sent out a memo this week that that was right. right. So there's this whole <laughs> big whole big thing going on. Do you want to know if that affects them or not? Um, I. I checked with my gang of seven on the waivers today. There were no workouts listed. I don't think they're going to bring anybody in. Mike McCarthy sounded like today that they weren't going to bring anybody in. So I, I think it's going to be a matter of go out there, try and work through some things. I'm so happy he made the last extra point, though. Just I, I oh, just, if, if, and, you, and if, he, if you if you miss that. My God, that now now you're in a bad, bad, bad spot. He and that that guy in the three years he has been in Dallas, 2018, 19, and and 2022, 
that guy has never run away from the media. No, at, not not at all. Not at all. That, he he will stand up there. He will take every not just stand up there. He doesn't. You don't have to pull him out. He is. He was standing at his locker, facing forward, expecting. Okay, I'm, I'm waiting for everybody. He knew it was coming, uh, and and he is he is honestly a, an admirable uh, professional. I, I think, and and I think that given what you've seen, which is a borderline Pro Bowl kicker this year, I it, it's concerning when you see four in a row because that feels like something psychological when you have it happen like that for things that are supposed to be so automatic. And, and I guess you don't know how easily that can be fixed. Um, but it also makes me feel like uh, we know what he's capable of. This is just there needs to be – there's a tweak or a – Yeah. To play. Maybe this is the answer, Bob. Um, and, and is the answer Hialahu or, you know, Garibay or who, whoever's out there? Is it a practice squad situation for the week? And do you use one of your elevations this week on the kicker for the 48? You know, do you use, do you use one? And do you, and if you all of a sudden you get in the game and he misses the extra point or he misses a field goal badly, then you immediately plug the other guy in and go. That's that, that might be the answer for how they're going to work this this week. I, I, me personally, I think if you bring a guy in right now, and he has to know this. I mean, he has to know what the situation is. Hell, he was brought in to compete against Hiralahu. You know, yep. they moved on from Garibay in training camp. So he was brought in himself to compete uh, against the kicker. So I, my gut feeling would be if they're going to play this, it's a practice squad, then it's a possible elevation. And if you have, a shaky miss or uh, something that goes wrong, then you immediately just make the transfer. You can't give away points in a playoff game. You just can't, you can't do that, but he's the one son of a gun that can hit it from 60 yards and win a game. You know, yeah. that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the scary thing right now that you're dealing with. Yeah. And, and I mean, he's shown, especially not just can do it, but has pretty consistently hit it from 50 plus for you yeah. uh, in the time that he's how been. many, what game was that? He kicked like four of them. He kicked four of over 50. Yeah. Yards. I mean, I mean, he's, 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 I mean, all this year, I, I can't remember what it was. I think he finished like eight of nine from 50. Like, I mean, he's, he's been, but there, was, there was a game this year where he made like every kick was over 50 yards. Yeah, that was er I think that was early in the year. Maybe that was like Cincinnati or Cincinnati. Yeah, it might have been Cincinnati. Yeah. One of those games. I know he. I know he kicked really well. But either way, it'll be interesting to watch that. We'll have some San Francisco preview for you this week. Uh, some chan a chance for this team to exercise some demons from last year. Uh, until then, we will talk to you guys later.